Welcome to Piano Talks with Warren Lee. Throughout my career as a music educator, come pianist. The very question that tops the list of FAQs I've been asked must be this: When should my child begin learning the piano? My answer has invariably been, it depends. But it seems that I have found a more precise and concrete answer, and I'm giving that away to you by the title of this podcast. But how did I come up with this number? I commissioned a research team of two, consisting of my two curious children, nine-year-old Caitlin and eleven-year-old Aiden, to team up with Google and Wikipedia to look up the age when fifty pianists began lessons. And those fifty pianists are not your average Joes, but the greatest of all time. Admittedly, selecting who makes my list is somewhat subjective and biased, but I did include the top 25 best pianists of all time from Classic FM's list in 2017, which included immortals like Mozart, Beethoven, and Liszt, legends like Van Cliburn, Horowitz, and Glenn Gould, and the present-day greats of Argerich, Pariah, and Long Long, etc. Rather amazingly, the age where one starts lessons seems to be a must-have in any artist's biography, and it wasn't too difficult to extract that data and put them on a spreadsheet. Two ice cream cones did it, really. And the average age that these great pianists of all time started lesson is 4.98. And if I count only the top 25 in Classic FM's list, the number is a little lower, at 4.87. That average age is 5.35 for pianists born before the 20th century. And for those who really love stats, I can also tell you that the median age is exactly at five among these 50 pianists, and that the standard deviation is only at 1.75. And 31 out of the 50 pianists started at age five or earlier. The youngest is Kissin, who started at two, followed by Mozart at three, and the oldest, Pollini, at eleven. All very interesting. If you like numbers like I do, the age of five seems to be the magic number and the answer to the most popular FAQ. Or is it really? It is only if you want your child to become a superstar pianist, because my set of subjects are not just pianists, but pianists from the highest echelon. Renowned psychologist Eric Anderson claimed that successful musicians and athletes alike typically invest 10,000 hours of deliberate practice before the age of 18, so you would bet that they need to start young. Another factor is that these pianists are probably all born with an abundance of innate talent that led naturally to an early start. When I was two and a half, my mum took me along to my elder sister's Yamaha music course, and among the four and five-year-olds, I was allegedly one of the most observant in the room. My mum loves piano music and used to play tape recordings of Mozart's piano music around the house, in the car, in the shower, in the kitchen, all the time. And one morning, when I was three, I sneakily went to the piano before anyone was awake, and played the entire sonatine that my sister was learning at the time, a piece I probably learned by ear after repeated listening. And upon turning four, I had my first piano lesson. The rest is, as they say, history. But does my personal story or my little research on the 50 greatest pianists mean that your child should also start at four or five? Well, it really depends. But before I reveal to you what it depends on, let's have a music break and listen to a piece of music by one of these all-time great pianists and composers, Franz Liszt, shall we? Here is his first version of the transcription of Rizkowski's March, taken from my recording on Naxos called the Hungarian Melodies.
So, what factors are in play to determine the best age for your child to start learning the piano? Firstly, the parents' motive. You have to make sure that your heart is in the right place, because it is a substantial investment that you are making. It would probably be years before that reward and pleasure is reaped. Don't do it at least not so young, if it is only a certificate that you are after, or because the kid next door is doing it. It is a huge undertaking and a test of patience for both the child and the parents, which could easily turn into an invitation to test or even wreck any parent-child relationships. Scheduling a piano lesson on your child's diary isn't just like scheduling a tennis lesson. It is not a weekly commitment, but a daily one. Learning to play the piano cannot be done once a week for thirty minutes. You have to know this and understand the level of commitment. Oftentimes, parents tell me that their children seem really interested in the piano because every time they walk by a music store, their children just could not get enough of the piano, tingling away at the keyboard. My cautionary advice to them is always this. Do you notice that most toys for infants and toddlers, and pets as well for that matter, emit sounds to draw the attention of their curious owners? Obviously, young children and your puppies and kittens love gadgets that make sounds. It is as simple as that. So, just because your child loves to fiddle around with a sound-emitting object, does not necessarily mean he is interested in sitting down and learning to read music, learning to count, learning to be disciplined, and practice scales. Which really comes to the next deciding factor: patience and attention span. This, of course, is variable from child to child, depending on his or her personality. If a child cannot sit still and focus on a task or any task that does not involve YouTube or a digital device for at least 15 minutes, you may want to wait until he or she is a little older. This figure of 15 minutes isn't really based on any scientific evidence, but on my experience teaching young beginners. If your little Johnny or Katie can't sit still, You'll just be paying me or a piano teacher to chase him or her around in half of the lesson, and you walk away thinking that you have invested in cultivating the artist in Johnny and Katie, whereas the reality is that you just paid for premium babysitting service for half an hour. Next on the list is the physical development of the child's hands. If the child's hands are too small or the muscles are not strong enough. Poor posture and habits form, and it would take much longer to unlearn later on down the road. Unlike violinists who have different sized violins to play on, a four-year-old would play the same piano as an adult plays. The instrument is designed for fully grown adults. So when's the right time to start? If I were pushed to give an answer, I would say no earlier than four. And even at that age, the child must have exceptional patience, attention span, and intrinsic interest. Five has proven to be a good age to start, based on my research, and maybe six for the average child. By average, I didn't mean ability, but more on the above factors like attention span, personality, etc. I know it sounds a little late by Hong Kong or Asian standard, but look. The universe has agreed that six is when a child should begin their primary school education, and could sit for longer lessons and last a longer school day. Maybe that's a good yardstick we should go by. Am I saying that your child shouldn't touch or do any music before the age of six? Absolutely not. The child's music education or exposure to music should begin at birth. And some say that it should begin ten months before birth. Your singing of lullabies and other kids' songs to them is a form of music experience. And generally, I'd love to see young children, infant, toddlers, engaged in singing as much as possible. And it doesn't need to be formal either. Through singing, children learn about pitches, rhythms, and dynamics naturally, and they can experience music. 
without learning the technical names and notations and labels. That can come much later. Just like children understand the words daddy and mummy, yes and no, before knowing alphabets or how to spell, I'm all for experiencing before learning. For the more outgoing and active children, I do often suggest them to consider taking drum lessons where they can, number one, develop a sense of rhythm, number two, burn their energy, and number three, doing all these while looking cool at the same time. Having a solid foundation in rhythm and sense of pulse would be beneficial in all future musical learning. It is important for parents to realize that taking formal piano lessons isn't just about learning one skill. It engages a young brain on multiple dimensions, such as a child is learning to read a foreign language in the form of musical notation, and pianists have not only one, but two different clefs to worry about. Imagine the same note being notated on different clefs and they look completely different on paper. Number two, a child is also learning mathematics, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and even fraction in the form of rhythmic reading. Number three, a child is learning to coordinate the use of fine motors in both hands, performing asymmetrical tasks. For that, try teaching your four-year-old how to tie shoelaces as a test. And last but not least, a child is also learning the value of commitment and working towards a delayed gratification. Skeptical as I may have sounded, I list all of the above not to deter young children to learn the piano. In fact, I'm pointing out the wealth, the breadth and the depth of benefits of piano learning in the child's experience. But this must be done at the right time and nobody knows your child better than you. It is usually at this stage of my talks on this topic that parents follow up with two burning but practical questions. So here I am answering these for you as well. The practical parents would ask me this. Is an electric keyboard acceptable for beginners? I do see the practical and maybe economical value of starting on an electric keyboard, but as advanced as technology is today, it still isn't the real thing. The sound may be awfully close to the real one, but the pure physics of the action isn't, no matter how you put it. And I'd prefer a real acoustic piano for another reason. Yes, it takes up more space and costs more, but good. That is the kind of investment that would make you stop and think twice before committing. Are you ready? Is your child ready? So my verdict here is a real piano over an electric one. Another often asked question is this. How can I find a good teacher for my child? Well, I can't tell you where, because that depends a lot on luck, not unlike winning a game of bingo. But I can tell you what qualities to look for in the first teacher. Patience, compatibility with your child's personality, a way to communicate with and motivate young children, an insistence in developing correct posture and fundamentals, and valuing that over the pace of learning. These are essential. Note that the teacher's education qualification or whether he or she has performed in Carnegie Hall doesn't make my list of priorities. He or she could have performed a dozen times at Carnegie Hall but might not know a thing about how to get a four-year-old to sit still. I was lucky enough to have the kindest first piano teacher whom I adored and who simply kept lessons very interesting. But she very soon saw my potentials and knew better to let go of me and pass me on to a really serious and strict teacher. We all need different kinds of teachers at different stages, and I couldn't have asked for better teachers or better luck with teachers throughout my formative years. I hope that you too would find the right time, the right path, and the right mentor to start your child's musical journey. And hey, it doesn't have to be the piano, even though my unbiased view is that it is the king of all instruments. Thank you for listening to Piano Talks.